Hello, my name is Elise Larkin, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Earth System Science at the University of California, Irvine. And today I'm really excited to be talking to the OCB conference about high resolution genomics and how we can use them to bridge microbial adaptation and basin scale geochemistry. In my talk today, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the BioGoShip program. And then I'm going to talk about some metagenomes that we collected as a part of this BioGoShip program and how we develop genomic biomarkers of global nutrient stress. And then finally, I'm going to talk about some future directions for these um, metagenomes that we collected as a part of the program. So let's start with a brief introduction. In oceanography, it has long been recognized that high resolution measurements reduce error and allow for accurate characterization of geochemical fluxes. One global observing platform that provides these high resolution measurements is the Global Ocean Ship-Based Hydrographic Investigations Program, which coordinates a network of globally sustained decadal hydrographic sections covering ocean basins from coast to coast and at full depth from the seafloor to the sea surface. These programs um, provide a wide range of geochemical measurements, including inventories of heat, freshwater, carbon, oxygen, nutrients, and transient tracers. However, omics has not previously been defined as a core GOSHIP measurement parameter. Thus, in an initial effort to understand global biological processes at greater spatial and temporal resolution, myself, as well as Jenna Lee, a former PhD uh, undergraduate in our lab, who is now a PhD student at Princeton, and Kathy Garcia, a former PhD student in our lab, who is now a postdoc at the University of Hawaii, led an effort to go out on ghost ship transects and collect high resolution surface ocean DNA samples. In total, we've collected over 1,000 DNA samples from about 800 stations on five ghost ship cruise transects, as well as three NSF-led transects. And these samples are at very high spatial resolution with the median distance between them of about 26.5 kilometers. We have pretty good coverage between about 50 degrees north and 50 degrees south and relatively good longitudinal coverage, though we are missing samples from the Western Pacific Ocean. This effort is growing with a large number of collaborators uh, joining the team um, with also a wide variety of planned omics techniques that eventually be implemented. So for more information, please feel free to um, check out the BioGoShip website. And due to the high spatial resolution of these measurements, BioGoShip and other similar programs really represent a unique opportunity to link biodiversity with hydrography, chemical dynamics, and ecosystem flux, and thereby improve our understanding of biogeochemical feedbacks on global scales. So now that you've had um, a brief introduction to the program, let's talk about uh, our initial study of the metagenomes that we collected as a part of the BioGoShip transect. And this work was um, largely uh, co-led by myself and Lucas Eustick, a PhD student in our lab, who did a great deal of the analyses I'm presenting here. So I just wanted to recognize Lucas's contribution to this work. So as we all know, food webs in the ocean are highly dynamic. And through both photosynthesis, photosynthesis and chemosynthesis, microorganisms control the flow of all external energy into the marine food web. However, nutrient limitation of oceanic primary production exerts a fundamental control on marine food webs and the flux of carbon to the deep ocean. Traditional Blackman and Liebig limitations hold that low nutrient concentrations limit the growth rate of individual cells, as well as sets an upper limit on the amount of biomass that can be formed. And this is commonly described as Liebig's law of the minimum or the leaky barrel, whereby if we think of biomass in the ocean as the water in the barrel, the biomass in the barrel is limited by the nutrient in lowest supply. And in the ocean, the three most common nutrients that are limiting 
uh, growth and biomass are nitrogen, iron, and phosphorus. Previous work has looked at nutrient uptake experiments and shown that um, many uh, microbial populations are co-limited by multiple nutrients. So we can take a look at this pretty famous plot by Moore et al, where they did a number of these nutrient uptake experiments. And you can see the primary limiting nutrient as the color in the middle of the dot, and the secondary nutrient as the color around the edge of the dot. Um, and so this shows that there's high variability in biogeochemistry and the limiting nutrient for um, microbial populations across the surface ocean. However, nutrient uptake experiments um, are often affected by detection limits. And so because of this, although we know that there are co-limitations between these three um, key nutrients, we can also imagine that microbial populations might exist on any sort of gradient of limitation between these different nutrients. So for instance, a cell might be more limited by nitrogen or iron or equally co-limited by nitrogen and phosphorus. But we could also delve into this further and think about how different nutrients might um, differentially affect different biological processes. And microbial, we know that microbial communities have high plasticity, resulting in a potential state of multidimensional nutrient limitation, which brings up the question, how can we assess this multidimensional nutrient limitation? And one way to do that is using model organisms. One important model organism in the marine environment is Prochlorococcus. It's the smallest known and most abundant photosynthetic um, organism on the planet. It's a marine cyanobacteria. It's also highly abundant and grows at up to 10 to the fifth cells per mil and accounts for about 8.5% of ocean net primary productivity. It is also um, globally distributed and highly diverse. We have um, known subpopulations um, within Prochlorococcus that partition the ocean based on factors such as light and temperature. So for instance, we can see the overall distribution of Prochlorococcus in the Atlantic here, which goes from about 40 degrees north to 40 degrees south. And we can see that within Prochlorococcus, there are two unique subpopulations or um, closely related phylogenetic clades, one of which is found at lower latitudes and higher temperatures, and one that's found at higher latitudes and colder temperatures. And as a result, these clades are often referred to as ecotype ecotypes since they occupy a unique niche. We also know quite a bit about Prochlorococcus genome content, the large number of fully sequenced genomes. Um, and so because we have well annotated genomes, we're able to see unique patterns in the gene content of Prochlorococcus. For instance, this previous paper from our lab showed that um, phosphorus gene coverage, which coverage more or less just means gene abundance, showed a unique latitudinal pattern going from bats up to about 55 degrees north in the Atlantic, whereby we had higher um, gene coverage where phosphorus was low, and then lower phosphorus gene coverage where um, phosphate was high, suggesting a quantitative relationship between phosphorus and gene coverage. Which brought, brings us to our research question, which is, can we use the principles of cellular adaptation to detect ecosystem-wide nutrient stress? And so in order to answer this question, we used our surface ocean metagenomes from the BioGoship initiative. And specifically, we looked at 720 surface stations from seven ghost ship cruises. And we used a tagmentation metagenomic protocol. <clears throat> which basically just means that we randomly fragmented the surface ocean DNA and sequenced it on an Illumina NovaSeq platform. We also added 228 samples from Tara Oceans and BioGeotraces to increase our global coverage of samples. 
And what we did was we took those sequence reads, we then quality controlled them and mapped them to um, reference genomic databases in order to thereby profile them and annotate the reads that we got. Um, by performing these gene annotations, we could then pull out, identi our, um, identify and pull out our target nutrient genes as well as single copy core genes. And these are just genes that are present in a specific ecotype in all uh, representative members of that ecotype and are also only present as a single copy, meaning that there's only one copy per genome. And we can kind of use this as a, um, a type of abundance normalization protocol. So, after normalizing our nutrient gene coverage by single copy core gene coverage, we then transformed that into a z-score and then also created some composite metrics based on a priori hypotheses regarding the biochemistry of uh, nutrient uptake, as well as based on the phylogenetic distribution of iron, phosphorus, and nitrogen gene amongst perchloroclacus reference genomes. And we classified these genes into what we thought was indicative of other high, either high, medium, or low iron, phosphorus, and nitrogen stress. So once we had all of these um, nutrient gene coverages, we summarized that using a principal components analysis. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with principal components analysis, it basically decomposes the variance in complex um, data matrices, whereby each of these dots on this plot represents a single sample, and it um, is basically a summary of the nutrient gene coverage in that sample. Overlaid on top of the dots are vectors for our um, stress genes, as well as our composite metrics, and they're colored according to nutrient type. Now, within a PCA, vectors that point in the same direction are positively correlated. Those that point in negative, uh, the opposite direction are negatively correlated. And those at 90 degrees or that are orthogonal to each other are uncorrelated. And what we see is this tripartite partitioning of the ordination space, um, suggesting a uh, suggesting strong orthogonal um, orth uh, orthogonal relationships between the different genes, as well as um, strong stoichiometric linkages between nitrogen, iron, and phosphorus stress. Um, in the laboratory, it's been shown, for instance, that perchlorococcus can use nutrients at a stoichiometric ratio above vertically supplied N to P, um, leading to a default state of residual phosphate and corresponding uh, nitrogen stress. This suggests that um, populations are mainly nitrogen stressed um, uh, on a global scale, but this shifts when we see um, differing uh, availability of different nutrients uh, across the globe. So for instance, when nitrogen and phosphorus are supplied by upwelling, we have a state of iron stress. Alternatively, when nitrogen is supplied by um, nitrogen fixation and iron is supplied by iron deposition, this allows perchlorococcus to draw down phosphorus, resulting in a state of phosphorus stress. Or, um, and so yeah, <laughs> uh, thus we have these sort of strong stoichiometric linkages. The other thing that we can do with this <clears throat> ordination is we can classify our samples based on where they fall in the ordination space. So we set these arbitrary vector cutoffs and then back projected where the different samples fell in the ordination space onto a global map. <clears throat> And what we see is systematic variability in the nutri major nutrient gene type at global scales. So for instance, we could take a look at the equatorial Pacific. And here we see a meridional shift between iron stress and upwelling regions where macronutrient supply relieves nitrogen stress. 
And as water flows outward, cells experience an adaptive first medium, iron and nitrogen co-stress, and then high nitrogen stress and even some P-stress near station Aloha. In contrast, in the North Atlantic, high iron supply increases the nitrogen fixation rate um, and thus the N nutrient supply, which then allows cells to draw down phosphorus, leading to a state of phosphorus stress. And finally, in the South Atlantic and South Indian gyres, for example, where we have low iron supply and low nitrogen fixation, um, we therefore have high nitrogen stress. Finally, we verified our new perchlorococcus gene-based indicator metrics with using a number of techniques. And consistent with our previous work, we saw a quantitative relationship between both the high and medium stress metrics and in situ nutrient concentrations. So in conclusion, um, we saw that genomic content provided a quantitative assessment of nutrient stress ecosystem properties at global scales. So now that we've seen uh, one, one example of how we can link metagenomes at high resolution with biogeochemical properties, I wanted to talk about a couple of other um, projects that we have um, planned for the future that link these metagenomes with um, different biogeochemical processes. And specifically, uh, with our increasing understanding of microbial adaptation and genome content, we can develop a strong synergy between biogeochemistry and biodiversity. Um, specifically, these high resolution genomics allow us to bridge nutrient carbon and oxygen cycles. So for example, previous work in our lab has shown that genomic biomarkers of nutrient gene uptake significantly improve predictions of C to P ratios when incorporated into a global trait model. You can see here we have particulate organic to carbon, carbon to phosphorus ratios in the Indian Ocean. And when we had a trait model that uh, included some of these genomic biomarkers, which is represented by the blue line here, it significantly improved the predictions of C to P relative to a trait model with no biomarkers. This uh, model was applied to a smaller subset of stations, but GoShip allows us to synchronize our hydrography and our omics based measurements in both uh, space and time, which increases the power of predicting both spatial and temporal changes in biogeochemistry. For instance, by pairing geophysical measurements with metagenomics, we will be able to better understand how microbial adaptation influences things like cell cellular stoichiometry and CNP ratios. Similarly, um, we can also use these metagenomes to link microbial community diversity with cellular oxygen demand. The respiration quotient is the, which is represented by this RO2 to C, is the amount of oxygen required to oxidize a mole of particulate organic carbon. Um, so basically chemical oxygen demand divided by POC gives the respiration quotient, which has um, unique uh, spatial vari uh, unique and systematic spatial variability. Um, previous work in our lab showed that this variable was strongly dependent on temperature. However, due to phylogenetically driven differences in cellular physiology, planktonic community composition may also have a strong impact on the respiration quotient. Thus, we can use our high resolution geochemistry measurements to link microbial diversity with cellular oxygen demand and the oxygen cycle. Finally, on very high resolution transects, such as our um, IO7 North and IO9 North transects, 
where we took samples every four to six hours, we can also link clade specific cellular division with primary productivity. Um, so this plot basically shows single copy core gene coverage as mapped to a reference uh, Prochlorococcus highlight to genome across all of these stations. And what we can see is the coverage is quite high. It's generally about 100x coverage across the entire transect. But if we pull out a unique station, we see this unique V-shaped pattern whereby we have greater coverage at the origin of replication relative to the terminus of replication um, represented by this purple line here. And it has been shown that this slope of replication is indicative of um, cellular division rates. And so when we take these slopes from all of these stations and plot them on a diel cycle, we can see um, a pattern that is consistent with our knowledge of Prochlorococcus cellular physiology and division, whereby the majority of um, replication or the peak number of cells in S phase occurs at 2000 or 8 p.m. We can then take these peaks across the transect, um, so these maximum replication slopes, and compare them to things like um, normalized carbon uptake. Um, and although the um, patterns are not completely the same, we do see a general similarity of increasing replication and increasing uh, primary production above the equator, suggesting a regionally dependent association between Prochlorococcus replication and carbon uptake. So Overall, I hope I've shown that our understanding of marine microbial genomes has expanded significantly in recent years, as well as at the same time, we've had an increasing equivalency in terms of spatial and temporal coverage of hydrography and omics-based measurements. This allows us to develop a strong synergy between biodiversity and biogeochemistry, as well as an improved ability to link marine microbial communities to nutrient oxygen and carbon cycles on global scales. With that, I'd like to thank my fellow members of my lab, um, the NOAA GOSHIP and PML science team, Captain and Cruz, as well as research funding from the National Science Foundation. And thank you for listening.